it's April 7th, 1975, and this is number 191 in the series of Dialogue Conspiracies. I have a guest here today, a fellow researcher. I'm really excited to have him. That's Bob Cutler, who has been working on four books, three books, and a diagram, a chart of Dealey Plaza. Uh, Bob? Yes. Should we okay. get right on the air? <laughs> I'm, re I'm ready anytime you are. Okay, I have a few announcements before we get started. But, Thank you. Uh, uh, then we'll get into your three books and your latest one, which is of particular interest at this time. Naturally. Yeah. The last one's always interesting. Yeah. Uh, I like have mentioned one. on Dialogue Conspiracy all of your uh, your other books and refer to them constantly. So it's really a pleasure to have you out here from Massachusetts to... So it's nice to be here again. ...share the broadcast with us. Uh, just a few quick comments before we start the show. I will be speaking at Consuma College in Sacramento on April the 18th. There are a lot of requests from people that listen to KZAP every week. Uh, when will I be up in Sacramento? Consumer College is right outside of Sacramento, just a few miles, and that's 8 o'clock in the evening, and I imagine there'll be some announcements in the newspaper, and we'll speak of it again on KZAP, but that is April the 18th. Also, I want to welcome some other program stations that are joining this program, particularly Vancouver, Canada, but Missouri is beginning to get tapes in KSML in Northern California that reaches Reno. And I have a series of new stations that are joining us this week. I'll mention them more specifically next week because we're short of time. I want to take advantage of Bob being here. But it encourages me because this is what I call the caravan of truth. And dialogue conspiracy is beginning to spread around the country. There are some important articles that I think you should be reading. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this show, that are new listeners, the format is to take the news of the week as it pertains to the past political assassinations and conspiracies and the current assassinations and conspiracies, and we show how the news of the current week is related to research done in the past up to that present news. And there are always articles coming out, new books coming out, or movies, and I like to turn you on before they leave the newsstand so that you can have access to them and do further research on the subject. As you know, I consider this a running course. It's a continuous course, and we don't duplicate many of the shows. So pick up these articles on uh, conspiracies and assassinations. One of them is the New York Review of Books, April 3, 1975. There's a new article by Bernard Fensterwald and George O'Toole called The CIA and the Man Who Wasn't Oswald. I did several shows on two Lee Harvey Oswalds, or possibly three, and maybe a fourth, and this uh, entire article is about one of the Oswalds, one of the 39 imposters, incidents of an imposter that I've spoken about. It, this article is entirely on that particular Oswald. The next article I would like you to read is Atlantic Magazine, this April issue. It's called The FBI File by Sanford Unger, and it is specializing into Deke DeLoach, Cartha Deke DeLoach, J. J. Hoover's close associate, and William Sullivan of uh, FBI. I wrote about him in my second Realist article, The Watergate uh, Senate Select Committee's Part of the Cover-Up, and William Sullivan is described as well as Deloge very clearly, and we'll go at a further date into the conspiratorial aspects of these two men and how they relate to the past political assassinations. National Tatler, April the 6th, 1975, has a centerfold article, Experts Agree Sirhan Didn't Kill RFK. It's a very good article, and for those of you that are able to get to Washington, D.C., April 23rd, that listen to this show before that date, Ted Chirac will be opening the movie The Second Gun at the Cerebus Theater in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., April 23rd. The Car Caravan of Truth is moving in that direction, and the movie will be opening at other theaters at the same time around the country. And last but not least, Time Magazine, March 31st, 1975, on the stands now, has an article about Howard Hughes' ship that brought up parts of the Russian submarine. And this is a very important article on Howard Hughes and indicates that there's a new president of Hughes Aircraft, a Mr. A.D. Whelan, who was formerly a high official of the CIA. And in conjunction with my article on the burial of Howard Hughes and that Hughes Empire is the CIA, I will talk about that at a later date. I don't want to go into it now, but these articles are very important. And True Magazine has a long article this month on Clay Shaw, the man that Jim Garrison arrested in New Orleans. 
we could do a separate show on each one of these five. The news is coming in so fast. But, Bob, you're down here uh, from San Francisco, out here from Massachusetts, and we're not going to spend another minute uh, about that news. We'll get back to it later. Um, do you want to describe uh, your three books? We have them here, and you're familiar with them. Just briefly, then we'll specialize on your latest one and share with the audience what you have written up to this point on the assassinations. Well, the one that isn't really directly connected with JFK assassination, of course, is the uh, You, the Jury, which has to do with the bridge at Chappaquiddick. And uh, that was done sort of in between the first book that I wrote, the first and second, which were combined into two flight paths, which the basis of that one was to find a man on the sixth floor of the, not a man, but a rifle anyway, on the sixth floor of the TSBD at another window from the so-called assassin's window. By looking backwards through the governor's chest, you could uh, track down where it was feasible that a man could shoot out of an open window which had been cropped out of the Warren report. Very interesting, that part of it. And uh, that, that was one of the first things that, let's say, that I really got quite excited about because having found that open window and having looked backwards along the Travis line through the thorax, through the governor's thorax, it became quite apparent that something was amiss there. there I mean, they should have included that picture in the, in the report, obviously. So from there, you can't leave the, uh, all the shots in Dealey Plaza until you've accounted for all the wounds and all the scars that are all over the place. Actually, there's a shot in the grass, and uh, Penn Jones has always maintained this uh, sidewalk scar, which you can go down and look at right today if you went and went up to the second lamppost and went about 30 feet along the sidewalk uh, in a northerly direction and halfway between the curb and the grass. You'll find a, a scar there, which he maintains is a shot from way across the grassy knoll, uh, at a very late date in the crossfire sequence of only seven seconds, and it's possible that they were shooting at the uh, tires, the way, for instance, in uh, Petit Clamart, when uh, President de Gaulle was caught in an assassination ambush that missed, simply because the driver floored it, and the tires were shot out, but the Michelin's inner steel held, and the car got away, whereas in this particular case in Dallas, we find that the car slowed down from four, 14 down to about 9 miles an hour. And uh, the president was killed because nobody floored it. That's one of the reasons, not the actual reason, of course, but certainly one of the contributing factors to the fact that, uh, that JFK did not get out of the way fast enough. The limousine was really slowing down too much, quite, quite the opposite of, of, of the way the French took care of their president. Of course, one of the big problems of the, the Warren Commission, uh, for those who are not familiar with that, and there aren't many today, but we yes. do get new people listening, uh, uh, maybe they're not familiar with the fact that the Warren Commission claimed, they know that Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly did all the shots in a certain specific time period, but many, many people like Bob around the country have done research on how many shots and the variation of the wounds and the evidence. Oh, yes. There's been a... There's been a lot of a lot of books that are out of date now. Yeah, of course. Be, before the researchers argue about which direction the shots come from or disagree right. or agree, uh, all of them, I just about agree that there were more than the amount that the Warren Commission. Said. There's no question about that. I mean, anybody that goes into the into any kind of investigation into the report and starts off with the premise that the Warren Commission started off with that there were only three shots from one place and one man did it, you you, can't, you don't have to go maybe for an evening before you begin to find evidence that this is absolute, absolutely false. It couldn't possibly be done. There's too many, there's too many wounds and too many men, there's too many scars in Dealey Plaza to have had one person fire three shots and take care of ten separate wounds and five separate scars. And besides what's available, the evidence is missing that would also prove that there were more uh, shots, like the car interior and the street sign. That exactly. Uh, Arlene Spector from the Warren Commission, the attorney for the Warren Commission that invented the one bullet. Uh, theory, yeah, the, the bullet single bullet three, theory. Single bullet right. 399 was on Tom Snyder's TV show this last week. And he uh, was asked, would you debate with persons regarding your theory about the bullet as against the researchers like yourself? Uh -huh. And he said, well, you have to realize that I'm a practicing attorney, 
and then I have to go over my work and make too much time to look up the basis on which he made the allegations, and therefore he wouldn't meet publicly. He'd never, you could never debate him, in other words. You couldn't debate him, no. And then he went on to say that one of the reasons he concluded that about uh, the bullets, that it was a single bullet that went through, was he mentioned the fact and had the nerve to refer to the car of John Kennedy, the interior of the limousine that was used as a reference in his work, and yet you and I both know that that interior was destroyed before there was going to be a Warren Commission. Right. When Texas was going to investigate. That's right. They took it out to, uh, the car was taken out somewhere in the Middle West. It ended up in Cincinnati. Yeah. It probably went to Detroit, I would imagine, first, then ended up in Cincinnati uh, in some firm that specializes in, in doing over cars. I heard it was and, Dearborn, Michigan. It was airlifted to Michigan. Yeah, yes. Well, the interior. Uh, after, oh, yeah, after Washington. Uh -huh. It went yeah. to Washington, then Dearborn, and then ended up in Cincinnati to, to re be remodeled. Yeah. Rebuilt, yeah. Right, completely uh, rebuilt. What is the minimum amount of shots, uh, if this were to be open thoroughly and Congress were to open up the John Kennedy assassination, what would you say would be the minimum amount of shots that got off in Dealey Plaza? Well, in the book that I've just written, which is uh, pertinent to trying to the reason I wrote it was to try and account for all the wounds and scars. I can't get it under nine shots. Now, that's more than a lot of people have, than anybody else has had so far. We've gotten up to seven, I think. Uh, Penn Jones had seven at one time, and I believe, I believe um, uh, Hepburn, who was an alias, uh, an anonymous, excuse me, a pen name, had uh, seven also. I can't remember. It's in the book anyway. Mm -hmm. Because I review all those, all those different, uh, different kinds of crossfire until getting to this one. So uh, I can't, you might be able to take one away, in which case, I suppose, eight, my, my minimum figure that I, will, I would go along with has got to be eight. And I, I'm using nine right now until somebody else tells me I'm wrong. Well, you know, the, one of the interesting things is that the witnesses in Dealey Plaza that were selected for the Warren Commission mm -hmm. to uh, give testimony all down the line had a standard. I heard one shot, and there was a pause, and then bang, bang. And it was either right. three to four, you know, right. first was a si firecracker, and it was exactly. set down so pat. But yet, you read ten years later, uh, Mr. Uh, St. John, or St. George is talking about uh, E. Howard Hunt and his assignment for political assassinations, and alleges uh, that a lot of people think that G. Gordon Liddy is irresponsible or a gunman, but they, he alleged, as a co-worker in the CIA, that E. Howard Hunt's men used silencers. And just recently, E. Howard Hunt had arranged for, through Mr. Conine to this assassination mm -hmm. uh, uh, equipment of place, Mr. Fox, to have new equipment made in microphones and all kinds of, of uh, things that would blow up. So it's very difficult to tell where fatal shots are. They have this kind of equipment that you can't count or figure on right. that blows up in your face. And if there are silencers, it is understandable that like you could come to nine and they could hear four. Sure. Because from the Dow Techs building, the Sheriff's building, or from the book depository itself, right. there's no reason why there can't be silences on the grassy knoll. It would seem very logical, especially in view of the fact that, again, Penn suggested to me, uh, oh, this is two or three years ago, he said, uh, the logical thing is that somebody told somebody to take the Manica Carcano and go up to that window, which is the so-called assassin's window, and fire three shots so that everybody would hear three shots. Very clear. And absolutely clear. And, and the even somebody saw the, supposedly saw the rifle being withdrawn, that's fine. That's what they wanted you to do. This is all part of the cover-up. It's the most, one of the most obvious things and why we have been so long in, in sort of taking hold of this and really making something out of it because it, it seems to... I, I stress it in here, and I, of course, Penn is the one that suggested it. And uh, there were three hulls left three hulls. Hulls is the terminology that the uh, Dallas police use for a spent cartridge. And there were three of those left, so there were three shots. They found the rifle, they got the guy that supposedly fired the rifle, and that was it. There's cold. the whole thing, cold. The only and you only heard with three shots and maybe one reverberation, which would make the fourth. That's it. But the, the only problem is that, uh, as we said, the, the car interior is destroyed, the autopsy x-rays were not really allowed right. to be seen, the street sign right. that would have been hit by some of the shots was removed. And I made a list of all the impossibles, and you know them too, uh, John Connolly's testimony that he was hit by a different shot. I guess your butt book uh, per, pretty clearly states all the evidence to believe, maybe you should share some of that, the reasons to believe that there were more than the three or four, the, the Pat story that they had as it went off from that area, and here's, like you say, the shells and this is it. But there were many reasons. 
uh, you know, to believe that there were more than those shots. Well, uh, certainly the most important reason to believe there's more than three is, is the famous single bullet theory, which uh, Alan Spector, I, I've always felt that Alan Spector was the father, the grandfather, the mother, the midwife, everything to do with the, with the uh, single bullet theory. I'm sure he was helped by somebody else. But it certainly was his baby, as, as we might say. Well, of course, he took the front, like Tom Charles Houston was as much the Houston plan as Spectre was to the bullet. Yes, He's right. He's not a ballistic man. In other words, the Pentagon writes the script and they're the front. But somebody had to think up this idea of going oh, yes. through, uh, one bullet going through through two, two guys who are not even in line. I mean, you know, this, this, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that was the very first book that I wrote, taking, taking the five different tests. Uh, uh, in five different positions on uh, Dealey Plaza and seeing whether or not a bullet could go, could be fired from the so-called assassin's window through the president and then through the governor, merely by putting the limousine on, the, on a drawing at different places along the way, along the motorcade route, and you can't, you can't do it. It just won't work. You have to, the, the bullet has to zig and zag and uh, yaw vertically, and it's, in, it's a physical impossibility. So right away, if you attack that, you, you, you immediately get into, there's got to be more than one gun here. Well, you know, the, uh, after John Kennedy was killed, the Texas Board of Inquiry was supposed to investigate, mm. and then they appointed the Warren Commission. And I think a very important thing is, that in the minutes of the Warren Commission meetings, which were declassified, some of them were, there was a question whether to publish the Warren uh, Commission exhibits and witness testimony, or just have the Warren report and nothing else. And Alan Dulles, who was formerly head of the CIA, said, we may as well print it because nobody will read it anyway. So there have been quite a few people that have <laughs> gotten into it anyway, whether they've read the whole thing or not, it's another question. How many years have you been at this now? Well, I got started very late. I, I started in 66, <laughs> just about on the third anniversary. I mean, there have been a lot of people that were working long before me. Not enough of us, but 66 is pretty good. Not bad. <laughs> what's, what's the favorite part of your new book? The new book that Bob has done is called Crossfire, Evidence of Conspiracy, and you can write to him if you want this book. I'll tell you right now, it's Manchester, Massachusetts, Box 1465, 01944, the price is fifteen dollars. It's a really a collector's item, an elegant book. I've mentioned it as I say before, and it's twenty five percent off for students. That'd be eleven twenty five. And maybe we should describe this new book because this is the one that uh, you're really proud of, and you should be. It's great. What is your favorite uh, part of this book, and, and what do you think is a major well, course, contribution to the research? Unfortunately, uh, the favorite, my favorite part, of course, has to do with all the diagrams that I made because I feel. I'm an architect, and so I like, I like to do drawings. And so this is not necessarily make the book a readable book, but it's a very good, it would be a very good research tool that you could use and check various things, because uh, a lot of it, the first 30 pages of 30, 40 pages or so, it's only 100 pages long, the first 40, 30, 40 pages trace the history of the various authors and critics who have brought into play the idea of crossfire and as it for instance uh, the first one I the first drawing that I have uh, in really in crossfire is a it was a uh, an editorial in the Midlothian mirror that uh, Penn Jones wrote in in 67 May 4th 67 now to put that down on paper I had to go back to him and say now look this isn't exactly precise but on the other hand we have it so that it can be put onto a drawing so that you can see the what relationships of the various of the various shots from the various buildings, mm -hmm. and some of them are impossible. Uh, eventually, you get you get to impossible situations where uh, you can't you can't fire and expect those shots to produce the wounds that were produced. Now, I do not criticize this kind of thing because this is the way men who were writing these things were, were not draftsmen. They didn't have anybody to help them with the drawings. And they were doing things on an entirely different basis. So I thought it was important to try and put all these things down, whether they're correct or not, is not You're what I'm trying to show. You're going to later as new evidence comes Certainly. in. Certainly. Then yeah. the second part of the book, what I do is to take all those things, look at them, and then take all the wounds and the scars, and then take the best of that. And and I have to make those decisions in order to make it come out the way I think it is. Now somebody else looking at this 
could very well say, well, look, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, and this works perfectly all right if you do it this way. Fine, I think this is, uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that should happen. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have an airtight case. Nobody has the real proof. Proof you have to put in quotation marks, and we'll have to do it for a long time. Particularly with the witnesses but we're getting killed closer. and the evidence destroyed, it's hard to get an airtight that, case. That's right. Even if it go to court. Well, I'm just thinking about yeah. making drawings, you know, and, and there's, a, there's always the human error, and there's a little place where you can slide a T-square or a triangle just a little bit more, and you can get, it might, after all, we're dealing with only an eighteenth of a second. And we're dealing with only about 130 feet it is. It's a very small so area. So it's a very, very small area. And I've kept myself completely into just the shots. Because, again, Penn suggested you ought to reach search one aspect of this thing and do it well so that you become, again, quote, expert in this matter, unquote. Now let's <laughs> get... So that's where, uh, that's where it is. Yeah. Uh, let's get into something really controversial now on this show because uh, I think there's room for controversy among the researchers. Uh, Mr. Grodin is getting quite a bit of attention for the movie, uh, the Zabruder film, the famous Zabruder film of John Kennedy. What is your opinion of the Zabruder film? Uh, what are your conclusions? How do you see that film in terms of helping the research, what it's doing, and how important it is or unimportant? Well, it's, it's very obvious that anybody that sees the film uh, at the very end, when you see the fatal headshot, the, one of the most important things is that the, that, uh, the president uh, goes, his head snaps backwards and his body goes off to the left and down into the seat. And everybody says immediately, of course, they assume that this is a shot from the front, from the grassy knoll. Well, it so happens that I don't exactly agree with that. I think that it's perfectly possible uh, to have a shot come from the rear and create the motions that you see, the movements that you see uh, on the film. Now, it's really it's very difficult to do any research with the film itself. You have to go to the archives and take the individual slides and go through them very, very carefully. And that's a long, it's a long, tedious process. And again, it is subject to interpretation because I've been there with another fellow and we both agreed on certain things but we would disagree on something else just looking at the individual slides as they'd be flicked onto the screen trying to find out what had really happened but I think the important thing is that the medical evidence that we have seen uh, in the head is that the the entry wound is high on the back of the head and the exit wound is on the front forward segment of the head also, pieces of bone were found on the infield grass 111 feet, 37 yards, forward of the point of impact. Now, Most I kinda, people never talk about that. I know. They I, talk about the flesh behind on the Secret Service men. They never talk about the part in okay, front. Okay, well now, if you'll also read, and I can't remember exactly where it is, I couldn't tell you where it exactly is in the, in the report, but both the Connollys speak of brain matter coming into their section of the automobile, which was just ahead of John Kennedy. They were sitting on the jump seats. If, for instance, a shot had come from the front, that brain matter and those pieces of skull could never have gone forward, and any brain matter and, and pieces of skull would have gone directly opposite the point 313 on Elm Street, and the motorcycle policeman would never have been hit because it would have passed directly in front of them. What happened was, is that the shot came from high, it was a glancing blow to the top of the head, it took brain matter and the skull, it raised it off into, it went upwards and forward, and then the force of gravity would just simply pull it back down again, and the motorcycles coming in got behind hit. got hit. They would never have been hit if the shot had come from the front. Mrs. Kennedy would have been wounded with a shot from the front, and the left side of the skull would have been completely blown off. That was a very, very quick shot. As a matter of fact, the range, the range on something like that, if this, this range is 72, this range is, is 30, something like 30, 40 yards. It's a very close shot. Yeah. It would have taken the left side of the president's head completely off and if fragments of that so shot, far, yes, fragments of that shot would have gone, it would have wounded Mrs. Kennedy, who was directly in line. If you look at the Zapruder film, and see that she is, and, and pretending that you're shooting from just about where Zapruder was, you'll see that a shot coming that way would have hit her. The, the fragments of the bullet 
or uh, fragments of the skull or debris, and she was not hit with debris. The blood on her clothing came from when she had to sit down, and of course his head was bleeding, and it was all over her lap and everything. Well, I, you know, after 11 years of research on the assassination, I have, you know, I've always believed, for almost from the beginning, that the Warren report covered it up, and I tried to understand the way they did it by reading the testimony and looking at the exhibits. And there was always an overemphasis on whether or not the shot came from the front when there's overwhelming evidence that more than four bullets came, and that's all you need yeah. to open the case. That's right. And what I'm afraid is that agent provocateurs within our ranks, mm -hmm. within our ranks, are going to break up mm -hmm. what is developing like somewhat of a movement now because it had to come eventually and diversify the opinions and talk about a lot of things which really aren't that important and take sides and argue about them and I'm afraid that they will split themselves on some of these minor details of whether it came from the front or back and ignore the evidence that because it was more than four shots there was in fact a conspiracy right, right. and and the important thing is who conspired to cover it up it's just like the Watergate uh, the cover-up was as gross as the actual planning of the murder who conspired to cover up, and these people are still alive, a great many of them, and they have names and mm -hmm. identifications. I talk about them on the air almost every week, some of them. But uh, there's so many factors, the clothing of John Conley, you know, that was sent to the dry cleaners, and the pristine bullet, uh, nothing came out, it was found on yeah. the stretcher. Very unusual, uh, with a Extremely. street sniping to have a bullet on a stretcher. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the impossibles are there, and so, uh, Congress is talking to me of opening this case now, but it's, I'm very afraid that certain people are going to take this thing and hang on one thing that the head went back and not get on with all the other evidence. Well, I, it, it is important. One of, the, one of the things that's been covered up, of course, is that all the doctors who saw the throat wound when the Kennedy was first admitted to Parkland Hospital identified it initially as a wound of entry. Now, that is the shot that came from the front. There was the a fellow on the grass, you know, there behind was, the yes. stockade fence, and everybody that thinks anything about how that could have been done will realize that, of course, there was somebody on the grass, you know, of course there was somebody behind the stockade fence, because that's a logical place to go. And plus the fact that you, you could track, you could track the, uh, your quarry, your target, as the limousine turned, you could track him all the way from, uh, from Houston Street. And so as he made the turn, as soon as he's made the turn, his zap, throat. you get him. And you get him just before, before the sign gets in the, the way. Before the sign, that's right. Exactly. He puts his hand up to his throat just prior to the sign. And he, he says, but the next thing you know, is that the doctors have said, oh, well, that wasn't, that wasn't, they turned their testimony around. And they, they said, because they used the, the, you know, they used that point as the uh, point of incision for the tracheostomy. Yeah. And that was what destroyed that wound. But the ones that saw it before that was used as the point of incision have identified it as a wound of entry. It was a small, neat wound of entry. Also, uh, Mr. Kellerman of the Secret Service testified, uh, along with your theory of nine, that there was a flurry of bullets, and the Warren Commission tried to control them. They said, oh, you mean right. three or four? He said, no, I know a flurry when I hear a flurry. You Ralph know? Yarbrough said the same thing. A Penn, flurry Penn of told me, and, and, uh, and Bill Poole told me. As soon as I came in to see Penn at the conference that time, I said, I got a new book, Penn. Got nine shots. He said, nine shots? And immediately Bill Poole said, that's what, uh, that's what Yarbrough said, a flurry. A flurry. Of exactly. And, and in addition to the flurry, uh, I think it was very important that uh, Kennedy, according to Kellerman, mm -hmm. received one shot and said, my God, I've been hit. And that couldn't even have been the uh, throat entry. Well, I see, th this is where, again... This could have been the finger-length shot. Of, you know, there were two autopsies. True. The true. FBI and then the one that Dr. Hume from Navy Intelligence burned. But for many of the listeners, they may not realize that there were two autopsies that were written in Epstein's yeah. book, um, Inquest, and one went finger-length. Well, a bullet that is not very powerful, obviously, that doesn't go through his body like yeah. the other, or through John Collins, that only goes finger-length, you could be hit in the back and say, I've been hit, before the throat shot comes. Yeah, I do it the other way around because I don't, I, I don't, I discard uh, Kellerman's theory, Kellerman's testimony. Unfortunately, you have to, you have to make certain decisions whenever you do this kind of thing. And I take all the other people in the car, none of them said that they heard him say anything. It was only Kellerman that said so. Mrs. Kennedy said, oh, he just looked quizzical. 
and he didn't say anything. So I've always made it. This is just a small matter of dispute. It he, was, he was very clear about the voice. Uh, there could was. be four people uh, traveling in a car or sitting in, in a movie or listening to a radio agree. station, and one person one person speaks up and the other one hears him, and the other two are looking in another direction. Right. right. And also John Conley, who is very much a part of the Watergate, the assassination team, the, the governor of, of Texas, who had a, he escaped alive in this thing, but he was very much part of the cover-up of the whole thing. Uh, he's not going to come out three months later when they've devised a bullet 399 and obliged that Kennedy said he was hit. Yeah. He, he, came, he only went so far as to say that they were shot by separate people, and right. I felt that this would assure him the nomination of president someday. Yeah, yeah, See, that I'm this, sure that's what he was working on. He was on. walking around with the fragments of bullets so he'd be president, right. and, and this, except for his scandal in the ITT and the Texas the stock swindle and the milk <laughs> thing, he might have made it. Yeah. You know, but when it came his Absolutely. day, he was caught. What is your favorite, uh, what is the most, uh, the central thing of this new book, Evidence of Conspiracy, that you like? the most that you think is, is, is it a major contribution to the researchers? If people read the book, uh, in addition to those wonderful graphs and charts, they're Well, I, su I suppose I'll have to go along with the, the uh, shot from behind that uh, creates the movement of the head and, and body the way it does. Uh, this is a, a, basically this comes from a man by the name of Whitney Joy in Tucson, Arizona, whom I've never met. But he, uh, he and I had been corresponding for some time, and he, he said, as far as it being an engineer, he was a retired surveyor, I think it was, or, or a civil engineer, and he said, you don't need a shot from the front in order to create this uh, movement to the rear. And I started thinking about that uh, for quite a while, and uh, it was a very difficult thing to try and put into words that you could really convince a lay person about, and it was, took a long time for me to be convinced but I finally got around to it simply because if you consider that the president was sitting with a back brace on which had an ace bandage down through his legs, he was com his lower torso was just absolutely completely solid and, and set right there. If you hit him, if you hit from the top a very glancing blow at the very top and off center, that's going to create a spin to the head. It will push him forward, but then you will have a rear head snap if you remember the old seat belts, the very first seat belts, that's exactly what happened to you when you got hit from behind. You snapped backwards, and they have now you have those headrests in so in, in, in the backs of the car, so you can't so you you don't get you don't you don't get that terrible head snap. It it, it goes back against the headrest, and at least you you just get a small something on your spine maybe. But when when we started thinking in those terms, uh, it began to be quite clear that uh, that. Uh, plus the fact of the location of the wounds, and plus the fact no damage to the left side of the skull, plus the, the pieces of skull being picked up a hundred, over a hundred feet in front of the headshot. It seems to me that, to me, that is the major work that I've been working on for a long time. Now, I agree that this doesn't make the, uh, it doesn't make it any better less or any worse, any less a conspiracy. It certainly <laughs> doesn't. All it does is make me feel a little better that I think I'm on the right track more than perhaps some other people. And really, that's all it is. Well, you know? when you're up front like that and you take a position as against the mainstream, well, you work individually, I work individually, or Penn Jones, right. or Sherman Skolnick, Dick Sprague, each of us is, is trying in our own way to put the evidence that we have available to us using everybody else's evidence that comes in to form our own conclusions. And... Uh, it sometimes is the unpopular version because the right. one that is pat and slick and decided for us doesn't stand up in time, but in your own time, you're not appreciated for what you're doing because you're right. out in the front and you're right. willing to take a different stand. So right now the researchers are, are all saying, you know, that the Zabruder film shows conclusively that the head goes back. And it really isn't important because if there's so much promotion given to that one thing, and the Warren Commission is opened up, it's exposed, the new Commission of Inquiry goes into the investigation, they may do some tests and find that you were right, and therefore the researchers are discredited and pass, cover this up. I'm afraid it can be used as a diversionary, where it really isn't important, as important as all I the agree. other evidence. I agree, yeah. The evidence is who cleaned John Connolly's coat, 
that it couldn't be used as evidence. Who picked up the street sign? Who gave the orders? Who thermofax Oswald's papers that were on the desk of the State Department that night and burned them? Uh, who ordered the car to Michigan to be destroyed? I'd like to see a picture of the back of the front seat. Never I'd, photographed. Never, never, never photographed. Pho never photographed. Absolutely. Never. Not, uh, not, not after one. the assassination. There is a picture. People I think that shows it before, but Love Field. With I the think roses you can see in the seat. Yeah. That's right. Whole. Never one. Never one. And, and uh, nobody's explained who that ordered. That picture might have been taken, you know. I doubt it. You don't think so? You don't think it would have been put in a file somewhere? Well, it, it was taken like the uh, tapes of Richard Nixon with John Dean and John Mitchell were probably taken, mm. but when mm. the court ordered him to produce them, they were gone. Yeah. They don't exist now, so therefore they never exist. Well, it's absolutely impossible for there not to be a hole in the back of that front seat if you subscribe to the fact that a bullet went through the governor's chest, because yeah. it just couldn't do all kinds of funny things. It, it only cracked, it's, it broke his fifth rib and it took about five centimeters, I think it is, off of it. There was no deflection, and it just went zap right through into the back of the front seat. There's no question there was a hole in there. Well, if the car interior uh, showed one hole or more, it yeah. could show the direction of where a gunman stood. It would show the type of weapon they used, and it would show how far they were. And so it was very necessary to not photograph it. You see, if it was Oswald alone, they would have photographed it and used that as much evidence as, say, the witness who testified that uh, she was a friend of Oswald's babysitter when he was two and a half years old. Uh, you know, this would have been an important piece of evidence to show that Oswald did it alone because nothing in the car showed that bullets came from another direction. So this absolute necessity to lock up the autopsy x-rays of John Kennedy, to destroy the clothing of John Connolly, to lock up the coat of John Kennedy. I met uh, John, Dr. John Nichols on my way out here in Kansas City. Oh, really? And he's trying to press for another suit on a, a neutron activation analysis, NAA, which Dr. Cyril Wecht had already told us. You know, Cyril Wecht said in that article, did you read that? Yes. That it had already been done. But, of course, uh, we, aren't, we aren't privy to it, and we no don't know where the report is. So when you take all the evidence that's missing, that's locked up, some that was never used, and the witness testimony that's so highly selective, mm -hmm. and then you take your your pieces of evidence, like the two autopsy reports, the finger-length bullet, the entry into the throat, and then the thousands of feet, the film that Dick Sprague had, mm -hmm. and his articles, you know, that were at Dealey Plaza, uh, there's no doubt that something happened there, and I, I think it's important that is people talk about the Zabruder film, that it doesn't hold a candle to the massive amount of work that you've done here, that you can really sink your teeth in. The Zabruder film by itself is not really the answer to, the, to saying, this is what happened. You've got to look at the individual slides. That's it's right. terribly important. See, I'm wondering, a magazine like Rolling Stone gives the Zabruder film all this attention, and uh, Mr. Grove... Oh, but it's current, around. you know. It's current, this and it's going to have national television. But would they take, when you send your book... Or your material, would they take the evidence of the conspiracy farther? Or are they just going to leave it at that level? I'm afraid that the, my, the real trouble with this book is it's for researchers. It's for other people to have as a base. And it really is too complex. Uh, it's really too complex for a lot of people to really get, dig into unless they really want to find out. But the main thing is that you've done this and work. And I'm sure a magazine article could never be that. Well, couldn't you condense it for that? Would they take it? I'm, I'm, I, I should, maybe I shouldn't say it, but I have a publisher that I'm, <laughs> that is interested in having me expand it rather than condense it. Oh, it'd be I very see. difficult to condense this You're because I'd, it'd be awfully hard to leave out because no. there's some good historical, there's very good historical things in here in reviewing all the old books that have uh, have been done, touching on Crossfire, of course, only. Well, I know that Crossfire is is your baby now because yeah. it's the current thing, and you're putting it into a book, and the, well, we go the to charts else are now. beautiful. <laughs> but I do I do have to talk a few more minutes. We have five or six minutes about the Chappaquiddick affair because you are one of the three main authors so far on the Chappaquiddick. It's always come to my attention when I give lectures mm -hmm. and. Uh, People have never gotten enough explanation about Chappaquiddick. And I've sold all the books. You're not going to well, print more? Well, I, only, I printed 250, I think it was. I don't know that I'm going to print more. It's quite an expensive article. Oh, really? Yeah. You mean at $10, do you lose money, or you're not going to well, get this out I'm, at all? I'm just, uh, I'm, just about, uh, I'm just about even on that, because it's a very fat book. Oh, but the Warren Report's out of print, and all these good I books are out of print. Sylvia Mayer's book, S S the S index and, to the Warren Report. And Six Seconds in Dallas, everything. I know. There's an awful lot of books that are out of print. And even Jim Garrison's uh, paperback 
of Heritage of Stone? Uh, Heritage of Stone was, was taken away. It's gone. There's no more. You can't find them anymore. I got this from the one of the paperback booksmiths in Cambridge. We're trying to do a push uh, and trying to get people to write to the government printing office to reprint the Warren Commission here is the 26 oh, really? volumes really? in the paperback. Yes, and I yeah. mention it frequently, and you might mention it as you go around lecturing. Right. Uh, you know, I have this class sure. with Ray Fabrizio out at Monterey Peninsula College on the assassination of Robert right. Kennedy and John Kennedy. And uh, we took hands, and we wore, there were about 50 students that wanted the Warren Report. We ordered the paperbacks, if not in print, and it yeah. was the hard job. There's yeah. no way to study. The government's most important document that they're so proud of, and uh, should be a historical <laughs> yeah. monument to their research and their investigative, you know, thousands and thousands of exhibits and 552 witnesses, but they don't have the nerve to let you read it 10 years later. Mm -hmm. It's off the stands. And yeah. uh, how could college students or anybody accept the government's version? They're told flat, outright in the Encyclopedias, yeah. Britannica, the World Book, the Almanac, that John Kennedy was killed by Oswald or Sir Han killed Robert Kennedy or James Ray killed Martin Luther King, and yet the document don't exist to show that they lied. Right. It's uh, very difficult. I don't, know, I don't know what's going to happen about all the non-printing. Could you, uh, if you get at your chapbook, uh, do I have to take it off my bibliography now? If people ask about it, I'm is it not available? I didn't, it's not available. I've got about five copies that I've got to keep for myself in case anything should really happen. If there happen, were a you know? request for them, uh, would you print oh, an extra yes. 100 and keep it going? I'd have take to, a mailing list? Uh, yes, if I could get 100, I'd be glad to go ahead of it. Okay, well, there are <laughs> 100 people. can do that. <laughs> if there are 100 people listening yes. to Dialogue Conspiracy we could, even, we could even get the price down, maybe, on the second edition. Uh, I don't know. I'll tell you, it is a really good book. Uh, it's called You, the Jury, regarding Chappaquiddick. Uh, this was from 1969 to 1973, a study, and cost $10. And it's hard for you to go back and get on microfilm the newspaper articles, and I made a list of things here that Bob hit in there, the early articles and his allegations on the impossible. Uh, maybe you could just briefly uh, say, you know, uh, some of the things that you feel about the Chappaquiddick Affair. Certainly. And explain what's in that book. Certainly. I feel that the first thing that happened was that the car in which Kennedy and Kopechny were riding was ambushed. Teddy, uh, Teddy was hit over the head and taken away. He never knew anything that happened on the island until 8 o'clock the next morning when Gargan and Markin came over to his hotel and briefed him. He certainly had no knowledge at all of what had happened other than he thought, and this is what happened in the magazine article about three or four years later, uh, Burke Marshall uh, told the fellow that wrote the magazine article, he said, uh, Teddy had a sort of a mental block about those first couple of days after the accident. He said, he kept saying, gee, I thought Mary Jo got away. And to me, that was a very important thing. What happened then after that, of course, once they removed Kennedy and took him back to his room, then they took the, the girl left her for, uh, kept her for a while, and put an awful lot of alcohol in her because her blood, blood level count was way over what she normally would have had if she'd had anything to drink, which she was known amongst her friends as not drinking. Then they engineered the accident. The accident was not an accident. You have, uh, the first thing that's very apparent was the straight skid marks. Those were not skid marks. Those were marks of leaving a patch on the bridge as the car accelerated. The vent was open on the driver's side, the uh, stanchion that holds the mirror, one of the bro bolts was broken, and that indicated to me, anyway, that the, all you had to do was lash the wheel, run it out through the vent, put it around the, the stanchion of the mirror, and when the right front tire hit wheel, hit the, hit the curb, the first thing that would go, or the weakest link in that chain, would be that bolt on the mirror. And the, the damage to the car itself, where it's damaged on the top and also on the side, you can't have both. It's impossible. They have both. You, they, what happened was that they broke the windows on the side before they before they put it over, so it would fill up. You know, with so it would fill up with water, so it would sink. How many feet of water? Well, at the time that they Teddy said it was done, it was only about six feet of water. But the time that it happened, it was probably pretty close to seven, seven and a half, feet maybe eight. It was what, around one o'clock in the morning. Uh huh. Well, your yeah. your research on that is, is identical to what I concluded at this end. You know, in the way that it happened, that he was taken to the island and was was uh, uh, told later what happened. He was brought back in the morning, and that she 
had blood on the black of her blouse in your face. Oh, yes, yeah. that's terrible. And she was left gasping so that by the time she, her, she was in the car, water, a couple she could of hours. Yeah. She stayed in the, in and the, the car. And the car was overturned. Yeah. And, uh, she was upside down and breathed the last of the air in that pocket. And all track. of this was I under the auspices of the Senate to investigate in 72, and they didn't right. do it. Well, the time is, is wheeling around here. I think it's just a time for uh, us to wind up. I'm sorry, we could go another couple hours on this. This is the trouble with research, yeah, they I, always can go on. <laughs> I really appreciate your coming here and being on the show. Thank you, me. May. And it, it's great to see you. It's a pleasure. And, uh, we'll continue <clears throat> again next week on Dialogue Conspiracy, and stay well and read your papers and do your homework till next week. <laughs> Does that this has been go Dialogue off? Conspiracy with political that research specialist goes off. May Brussel, who for 10 years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California.